technology going. So thank you very, very much for the kind words. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm not going to talk about forecasting the future. We'll talk about some things that were, gotten, that were right, some things that were wrong. And uh, first an introduction of myself, I'll make it fairly brief. My background is very much as a business generalist. Um, I started out actually as a mechanic. I used to blow things up as well. I worked with explosives. But my professional career started out in investment sales and training. And by the way, if at some point you can't hear me in the back, just yell out and let me know that you can't hear me. Um, I've done five startups that I admit to. And as some die off and new ones start, that'll probably stay at five. Um, had many different roles. Uh, worked in a number of different industries. But in, in the IT space, I've done both hardware and software in retail and enterprise. And I'm the executive director of the AICML, which I'll talk about in a minute, as well as the uh, CEO co-founder of a company called VibeDX, who won Venture Prize uh, in 2011 with that. It is also a startup. Let's talk about what is machine learning. And so the things that I want to really differentiate, if you look at people in statistics or math, they do a lot of the same things we do. But the thing that really differentiates machine learning is the machines get smarter as time goes on. So an example of what is not machine learning Again, it's pretty straightforward, an accounting program, querying a database. Uh, if you had an automated welding in a manufacturing environment, I apologize for standing in front of the screen. I'll try to dodge around a bit. But if you, uh, if, if you have a manufacturing environment where you have a welder, it knows the X, Y, Z axes, or axes, and it would go to that specific spot, and it's told to do that all the time. So there's no real intelligence in that part. Having said that, if you send a robot to Mars, nobody's been there. So it has no idea what's there. You have some idea, but as it goes on, it needs to learn and discover, uh, make sure that it doesn't fall in any holes, et cetera, et cetera. So machine learning will allow it to adapt, and that's part of the art form that's in machine learning. So what is the AICML? We're founded in 2002. Our funder is Alberta Innovate Center, or Alberta Innovates Technology Futures. Um, we were ranked as one of the top three machine learning centers in the world. And when we say we've done 100 different, 110 different technologies, it's probably been a couple hundred. We just haven't tracked them all, depending on what stage of development they got to. And we are larger than some faculties on campus. So this is where our students go. Uh, you'll recognize both the business side as well as the academic side. They're in high demand all over the place. Sorry, I'll quit fumbling with the microphone, too. And when we first started out, the, the uh, reason that we existed was to actually do world-class research, and which we did. One of our PIs is now the Dean of Science, was uh, given a top 10, or was recognized as creating one of the top 10 um, scientific discoveries of the, in the world in 2007. That was by the, the journal Science. Uh, but we also realized, and our funders have told us this as well, that we must have a positive impact and give a return on investment for the funding that goes into our, our organization. Because if all of our students head south or go offshore, uh, it doesn't really do anything for Albertans. So things that we try to do in terms of connecting with business, and Granify actually hired one of our graduates this year, uh, which we're grateful for. Actually, it was last year. Um, but uh, we want to enable Alberta-based organizations to be more competitive through the application of machine learning. Uh, we actually are trying to place our students in companies, whether they be startups or mature companies through an internship or if they get hired there. And we also create startups out of our center as well based on machine learning technologies. So my other hat that I wear, I'm the CEO of IBDX Diagnostic Corp. It is a medical device for diagnosing problems of the back and spine. And if you look at where it came from, um, things like civil engineering, aeronautical engineering, I used to fly sailplanes. And because they come apart so you can transport them, part of your examination of the plane is you grab the end of the wing and you shake it. If the other one, other one doesn't shake, you're going to die because they're not bolted together in the middle. So what you do to determine, determine uh, 
rigidity and stability in the plane, make sure the structure is solid, is it will actually give very consistent waveforms. So that's what we actually do with the spine. And if you take a look, here's a wing with a bunch of accelerometers on it. So you just apply the vibration through the shaker and that's how it tells it what, what's going on. And if you take a look at, since nobody had adapted it to human use, uh, this is what our device actually looks like. It's in a local clinic right now and we're doing some more clinical trials with it. So as a summary to that, uh, it addresses a multi-billion dollar market. We don't require a special room. An MRI, in some cases, can be anywhere from 25 to 150 tons. It has to be shielded. Uh, we cost less than 10% of existing technologies. We have four to six times the patient throughput, and physician return on investment is only 18 months. So instead of spending two and three quarter million dollars on an MR, uh, our technology is quite a bit cheaper. So I wanted to talk about historical predictions. Now these came from PC World, and there's some debate around how real all of these are. Uh, I'm not going to read them out to you, but I think uh, most of us have seen some of them. I kind of like number two, actually, that television won't captivate people. Uh, I think it's indicative of, of established industries being worried and arrogant at the same point in time. Uh, going on to the, I, I, fine, nuclear-powered vacuum cleaner is kind of cool, too. Um, I don't think I'd want one in my house. And uh, here's a few more. And ultimately, taking a look at, you know, I, I know Google Chrome's been a little slow on PC lately on the Mac. It's been fine. But I don't think we had any sort of cata catastrophic collapse of it. But ultimately, <laughs> forecasting, you're always wrong. It's the degree and how, how wrong you're going to be. So if we take a look at uh, economics, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, a, a fairly well-known economist when I was in grad school said, here's my best tool, and he pulls out a six-inch ruler. And he says, well, if the economy is doing this, we put a ruler on there and go, yep, looks like it'll continue to do this. When it changes, they go, oh, I guess it's doing this now. And the, the best thing you can do if you ever hear an economist talk, and I'm not an economist, is ask them what they were saying six months or a year ago, because it'll be completely different than what they're saying at that point in time. Let's look at some other predictions. These are a little, more, little bit more fun. I'm very certain that the uh, Global Defense Network and Terminator did not destroy the Earth in uh, 2011. Having said that, I do know that uh, some defense contractors are actually trying to build planes that are not UAVs. UAVs are just remote control, but things that will actually go off and do a mission and come back on their own. <clears throat> I don't think we're going to get to a flying skateboard in the next couple of years. Um, I don't know if anyone's old enough to remember the movie Escape from New York, but it is not a prison. Uh, they, that was supposed to be 1997. Uh, Blade Runner, six years to go for those flying cars and the uh, genetically engineered robots. And finally, 2001 Space Odyssey. I don't know if the date really was 2001, but at the time it felt a long way out. And I am very certain that my computer's mentor is Hal. So on to my next slide. So let's talk about some of today's technologies. And I'll talk about some of the stuff we've actually built at the Machine Learning Center. So uh, Meerkat is one of the products that we have and it's for social network analysis, not social media, but social networks. You could use it for epidemiology and a number of other things. But in this particular case, uh, we had an organization that said, we need to understand how communication flows. Does it flow from the top down, bottom up? Let's figure it out. So as most good projects start, you have no time and you have no money, but we want an outcome. So anyone that does startups realizes that's how they always turn out. So what we did is we mapped internal communities. So we took six weeks of email, just the email addresses, and the subject lines. So what happened was there were 11 distinct communities and they looked like this. So long story short, communication did not flow up or down. Uh, these communities, this is a, a pan-provincial organization, so it spans not just the city and different, different uh, offices, but throughout the whole province. Now, that's great, but how is it actionable? Because if you take a look at a lot, a lot of what's coming out of big data, is companies say we don't get any value out of it. So in this particular case, and in any other case, you have to have actionable, actionable uh, results. So our methodology was to identify top connectors. So these are your social butterflies. The second part are people between this. And they're, you can call them mediators or moderators. They're in between a lot of the conversations. And if, you, if you went back to that map and actually drilled down to see who's what in there, you'd actually find that some of those people might be secretaries, and some might be executives, all sorts of different people, but it's just the way they interact. So what they did to succeed is they created unique distribution lists and advisory networks. So I don't really like meetings very much. Um, I call them the alternative to work. And uh, I don't like conference calls either, but this organization had a weekly conference call. 
but there was important information, and we're all del we're all deluged with all sorts of con communication now, whether it be Twitter or Facebook or whatever you're using, email, text. In my case, BBM. Yes, I still use BlackBerry, and I'm proud to admit it. Um, but what they did is they said to the people that were the the uh, uh, people in the between this space, they said. Who, based on what's going to be in this new or this next conference call, who needs to attend that? And the people that don't need to attend it really shouldn't go. So the information spread much more effectively. Second part was for social events. They took the people who were, uh, who were also very well connected and had them invite people, and they got a much better turnout for that. So long story short, uh, they were able to mu have much better engagement um, with the right people and have more effective communication. But and more importantly, you could actually reduce the volume of communication. So I don't know about you, I get a couple hundred emails a day, I don't read them all, and I'm never going to read them all. So that's one example of one of the things we've done. Next one is the Brain Tumor Analysis Project. And I talk quite a bit about healthcare because the data is really good in healthcare. So if you had a brain tumor, God forbid, but if you did, the standard of care is two centimeters around the tumor, that's what you treat or you take out. For 99% of the people, that is good. You get all of the cancer and you don't get recurrent cancer. For 1% of the population, the cancer will come back. Bad news, if you're one of those 99%, it meant they took too much healthy cell, too many healthy cells, so they've created more damage, but saved your life. So if we take a look at what this particular project did, is you could predict the growth pattern and the behavior of the tumor. So long story short, it may look like this going forward. You may need three centimeters on the one end, but if you take a look previously, it was kind of in the center of the brain. That's a lot less, to, lot less healthy tissue you're taking out there. These are interesting technologies. They're really hard to get to market, but this is the type of thing that exists. Let's talk about predicting cancer. So one in two Albertans will get cancer. My dad had prostate cancer when he was 10 years older than I am, and which also says that he had it when he was young and I'm not that young. So the, this is inspired by the Tomorrow Project. There's a project in Alberta tracking 50,000 people through a very long period of time uh, just to see what impacts li your lifestyle has on cancer. So in this particular case, this is about breast cancer. So 1,386 women, 810 that had no known cancer, and 570, pardon me, and uh, that had no known cancer at the time, but they could have had cancer previously, and then 576 that hadn't. SNPs are genetic pieces of data, and 378 questions, so 763,000 pieces of data. So this is pretty hard for the human brain to figure out. You pop that into Excel, and how do you find the correlation? So we use machine learning to find this, and that isn't, our guys get really excited the bigger the data set. If you go, you know, we have 10,000 data points, so they can, yeah, 100,000, yeah, millions, yeah, billions, that's really interesting. So the outcome of this, um, Again, some features were way more meaningful than others, but if you just said everyone's going to get cancer, it was 58%. If you took the questionnaire, it went up to 80%. If you, added, if you just took the genetic data, you're at 62, and both, there's really no difference between the two. So this is kind of disappointing for, genetic, for geneticists, but so be it. Um, some of the things that wouldn't be particularly obvious are, and again, if you're of Ukrainian descent, don't worry, this doesn't mean that you're going to get it. But in terms of Caucasians, Ukrainians have a higher incidence. And if you've been bitten by a mouse, a wild mouse, you have a higher incidence of breast cancer. So those are the things that wouldn't really, I don't think you'd actually figure those out just looking at the data. So machine learning is very good at that. Um, on to another thing. So this is one of our postdocs, Patrick Blarsky. If you're at the TEDx, uh, I can't remember, the last TEDx that happened. Um, he actually presented, and so this is an adaptive prosthetic. So his little robot's actually wired into him. So it's not—it's just skin-based. So it isn't wired into the into the nervous system. But through that, this will actually learn. And machine learning is very good at taking a fire hose of data. And what I mean by that is this will do five to six thousand predictions a second. I'll talk about another another application for that in, a, in uh, briefly here. But we actually are using this on an amputee. So there's somebody who's actually um, been injured and we've connected them. And the nice thing about it is traditional prosthetics are very clunky and they're mechanical in nature. So you actually require movement. Within a matter of weeks, people, especially if they're upper body, tend to stop using them because they're tired of poking people, hurting people, breaking things. In this particular case, it knows that, that if I'm used, if normally I do a movement like this, it, I'm probably shaking a hand or do picking something up, so it becomes much more natural depending on the degrees of, degrees of freedom from the, uh, the uh, 
prosthetic you're actually using. So it learns from the human, but it also learns from itself over time. So it'll become much more natural. So this is exciting stuff that we're doing. So what's another example of what you would do with this? Well, five to 6,000 times per second. Uh, I, used, I worked eight years in investment sales and trading, so there's a very natural application for that. Uh, I can't remember quite the number. I think it's 40% of all trading on stock exchanges right now is computer driven. It's not people actually making a decision. So I now need to switch computers and we'll talk about that. So what you see here, this is a live ticker and you'll recognize Apple, Google and Microsoft. The reason they're up there is they're pretty active. So today, Microsoft has traded 11 million shares, uh, Apple at 3.4 uh, 3 million, and Google just under a million. And this is the activity that's having, happening right now. So it's going to tell you what, what the company is, the trade. This is called tick data. And you'll see there's multiples happening per second. And uh, so they actually measure it down to a thousandth of a second. So what's important in this? If you take a look at this, that means right now with Apple, at $422.60, there's 200 shares it would like to buy. So that's the highest bidder, and on the other side, there's only 700 wanting to, or pardon me, want, um, that want to sell at that price. So this is known as your bid and ask. This will make sense in a second. Um, again, if you take a look at these volumes, there's no way that these are correct numbers, but they trade on multiple exchanges, etc. So the important part of this that I want to talk about is actually the ethical component. So being that computers will learn, and uh, will actually... Um, be able to make decisions itself. This, this is what you, if this was Microsoft's current price, based on what I just showed you, you'd have something called market by price. And these are, again, this is the highest anyone wants to pay, to pay, lowest anyone wants to sell. But underneath that, there's a whole bunch of other orders, and there's volumes related to that. So someone might create an algorithm, and keeping in mind the stock market is pretty complicated, but it's pretty simple at the same time. It's supply and demand. If there's more buyers than sellers, the price goes up. If there's more sellers than buyers, the price goes down. So in this particular case, uh, you might have an algorithm that uh, says, if I see buying or selling pressure, I, I know that's an indicator, even though it's not in the market currently. And, and these can go on, not indefinitely, but quite deep. I know that, that uh, if there's a lot more buyers, that this thing is going to go up. If there's a lot of sellers come into the market, it can absorb it. So one of the things that has happened in the past, so again, taking out the same scenario, all of a sudden now you've got an extra 300,000 shares here. So this would likely mean this is a very positive thing that if somebody wanted to sell a lot, it would be fairly buoyant, but if they really want these shares, it's actually gonna move up. So as a algorithmic trader, you may actually say, I'm gonna screw with this algorithm. So what I'm going to do is I will flash this for a thousandth of a second. No individual will pick that up, but the computer will pick it up. Now, somebody else's algorithm has said, if I see this, I'm going to start buying. So nope, he hasn't, the person that just flashed that, the computer hasn't said, I'm going to sell a whole bunch to you because you're going to start buying, and this is all gonna happen on an automated basis. So there's certainly a lot of ethical uh, issues around computers making decisions. But uh, anyhow, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what's, what's around today. Uh, I certainly have a lot more examples, but wanted to leave it open for Q&A and, &A and uh, you know, get some of your thoughts. So that's actually the end of my presentation. So, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, as Cam and I were talking, I think what we were interested in is Cam just wanted to do sort of a scatter shot of some of the things that the center's doing, some of the things that, you know, the implication, or, you know, uh, some of the things that, you know, what machine learning looks like. And then let's talk about the implications or what, you know, because uh, I think that's what the future is, is the implications of something like machine learning is what does this mean now that uh, machines are trading more than humans are, right? And, and decisions are being made in that, yep. in that way. So maybe that's good to move in that direction. Sure. Any questions? And don't be shy. I just have to stand up here and talk for 20 minutes so you can talk. <laughs> Given all this uh, wealth of information and knowledge, what is the future for wisdom? <laughs> That's actually a good question. So everyone here knows what T.J. Watson is. It's the, the IBM computer that was on uh, Jeopardy. So we were fortunate enough, and pardon me while I sit down. Sometimes my back gets sore and there's some irony in that. Um, so Jerry Tesoro, who's the project manager for that, came up and spoke, he spent a week with us in the fall. And so I said, okay, Watson's really neat. What are you gonna do with it? And he said, well, in a medical setting, think about it. You're, you're an MD and you could be a, general practitioner, whatever the case may be, but you're going to deal with a whole bunch of different cases. And you may or may not know what 
um, a particular condition is. Or maybe you did, but it's being treated differently. You don't have the latest. So what you actually do is you ask Watson, based on this condition, what are the late, what's the latest research based on this? And then it comes back to that to say, okay, here's, here's some of the latest research on how it's being treated. So some examples that you might find is, um, I know vac vaccinations at one point certainly had a, a fairly uh, polarizing group of people that liked and didn't like them, but it's since been proven that uh, the guy that did the research wasn't quite upfront with everything that he had proposed and there was a bit of competitive issue in that. Um, but that's an example of somebody, you know, you may, there, have, there were some docs that actually said, I don't believe in, you know, vaccinations, the risk may be higher than, than not. Whereas now the research appears to be pretty clear that that is pretty incorrect. So things like that, whereas, is, you know, in the medical field where things are changing all the time, if you look at our guys, they're publishing um, 80, 90 papers a year from nine people. Um, and, but if you look in the medical field, those can be actually be quite a bit higher. So there's a lot, a lot more research coming out. So that's an example of, of wisdom where it's, you know, the human brain is way better at doing things than computers are for the most part. Um, but over time, I think we'll have to remember less and rely on technology more to, to just keep track of that. Does that answer your question? More or less? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question. So the question, I don't know if everyone heard that, but the question effectively is that the investment industry is driven by profit. So how do you make sure you tie ethics and profit together? Is that a fair summation? Um, and again, it, it, if you take a look at ethics, they mean different things to different people. So you can find some societies where it's not wrong to screw other people because it's just if you can take advantage of somebody, then they deserved it. And you have other societies where that's a big no-no. And it, it really depends on, it's contextual. So I think um, the issue has been, if you, if you look at our legal system, it gets broader over time, right? The, the field of law gets broader and broader because the interpretation of, well, this doesn't say it's wrong, right? And you're asking, how do you say whether it's right? I, I think that's the, the delineation. So the, if you, the investment industry specifically captures a lot of the best and brightest minds because there's a lot of dough to be made in that particular environment. So I'm not sure I actually have a good answer for you, but I, I think fundamentally it really becomes if the markets are not transparent, it's and transparency actually isn't good for making money, obfuscation actually is, but if, if the markets aren't transparent and the markets aren't perceived to be honest, people don't want to trade in them. And then as, you, as a company, if you can't raise money, good luck, right? So you've now taken away, because the, the financial industry has been around forever. I think they've started trading futures back in the 1600s and 1700s. I can't remember anymore. It's been too long ago when I studied it, but the, um, I agree, it's not going to go away, but it really becomes if, if, if you don't have an honest system, people won't play in it because they're not interested in losing their life savings and you will not be able to raise money, which then stifles capitalism, jobs, and everything else. So I, I think fundamentally there's a tie there. Uh, it's just, it's really hard to bring it back to the because ethics means something different to everyone, unfortunately. What do you think is the long-term impact on education? That's actually a very good question. I'm glad you brought that up. Well, so it's, so it's interesting. So the question is, what's the impact of, in terms of education with technology? So if you look at MOOCs, for example. So let's take two different sides. You have, 
traditionally universities, when you finish university, you're, you should have some degree of competency based on the fact you were tested in your, your field of knowledge, depending on how well you did in school, but your field of knowledge should be at a certain level. Um, as you decentralize that, um, you know, you're going to lose a piece of that. And a good example of this is my, one of my sons who, when he was 10, finished the Comp Sci 101 course. And so he's, you know, before the end of grade five had finished. They're not quite, some of them aren't quite university courses, but they're certainly um, way beyond what they're going to learn in, in uh, any of the grades. And so, and my daughter's halfway through it as well, and for them it's great. I mean, we, we actually started getting into the Python components of that, so, you know, got a kid in grade six who is explaining exponents to his classmates. So I think, I think the interesting piece that will come out of this is who's the customer on the online learning? And so I'm, I'm kind of diverging a bit from your question about doctors specifically, but there's the domain of, of getting a degree has generally been people that can afford it. And again, I, I went to a well-known business school and I'm, I'm proud of that. I got in, but it cost me an awful lot of money. Um, do I think I get a great education? Yes, but I think other people do as well. Fundamentally, I think the thing that will be changing on the education side is the ability to do things. There's actually a school and uh, a group in Rwanda are going to create a degree program around MOOCs. And if the, I think, does everyone know what MOOCs is? Anyone not know what it is? Uh, it's, um, so there's, also oh, MOOCs is massively, Massive Open Online Courses. Or, yeah. And there's, there's kind of three big players. There's uh, one out of Stanford, uh, which is Coursera. There's Udacity, which the University of Alberta actually signed a memorandum of understanding. Got to spend some time with Sebastian Thrun, who's one of the founders. One of the other co-founders is one of our graduates, which I'm proud to say. And then the other one is edX, which is some Ivy League, uh, MIT, Harvard, and a couple other ones. And uh, if you take a look at the function of, of learning new things, you know, as a pro and I, I think specifically IT is really unique in this. Does anyone actually care if you have a degree, if you can do the work, right? If you're functional and you're a really good programmer or developer, do you need a degree behind that? And I'm not saying education is not important. I have five years in investment management studies uh, in addition to the other schooling I've done. So I think education is important. But if you take a look at now you've leveled the playing field where you've got people that all they need is an inter internet connection, they can learn a lot of the same as if they came to a school. Their accreditation doesn't exist the same, so, so you won't necessarily know their function or their ability to function, but if you, if you take a look at um, somebody doing a startup in some other country, you know, they, they may have some great functionality, and I think, we'll, I think we'll see more interesting things coming out of developing nations due to that, so I think that's interesting. Now, to answer about doctors, I think you still need some level of accreditation. Actually, good story. So a friend of mine I went to grad school with is an MD, and he will remain nameless, but he said, uh, there's certain people I would prefer to go on on my own than see them as doctors. We said, well, that's because you're a doctor. He goes, no, no, if I had no medical education, <laughs> there's certain people. So again, there's, there's people that slip through the cracks, but it's, I think you need some sort of check mark saying this person is competent at their job. But I, I think the, I would hope rather than diffusing the quality, it would actually increase the quality over time. That would be my hope. I think it's a matter of leverage, and so if you, from a bit, so I think open source is important. Um, having said that, I only know of one business that's done really well with open source, and that's Red Hat. Uh, so I think that that it has limitations, but it has benefits at the same point in time. And I know there's more than two different camps based on that stuff. There's a plethora between open source and and the stuff that is not open source. But I would I would think over time, if you take a look at, um, so I have an old Cisco router somewhere. That thing was a pain to set up, right? It, it was, I mean, you literally had to go in and code every single function. You know, think about the first time you, well, for me anyhow, I tried to hook up a, a Linux operating device back in the 90s, 
it took me two days to figure out how to make the video card work. So an example of that would be, you know, within a couple of years, you could just buy something, it would load up, and away it would go. It could recognize, recognize all your drivers and things like that. So I, would, I think over time, machine learning will actually make the development cycles quicker. Um, I'm very afraid of black boxes. We have developed some software previously where you put something that's open source, it's a black box, and you have no idea when you make changes what that actually is going to impact in the rest of the product and your output. Uh, but I would think uh, based, and CompSci is really interesting because of the fact that people collaborate in it, right? You wouldn't survive without collaboration. It's just the field of knowledge is too big, the amount of work is too big. When I worked for Intuit, uh, and this is back in the 2000, two, three, four, um, I think we had five million lines of code in QuickBooks. Now some of that was, you know, developers putting their names in and stuff, but it was a very small piece. Um, but it, you know, again, as, as time goes on, it's, it's, it's not a one person job. So as you get more tools that can automate those processes, I think you're actually in a position where the speed of development will, will pick up, hopefully. It really. It depends on the human, right? <laughs> um, I, say, I say that in general. <laughs> uh, we'll, 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 we'll use me. I'm good at laughing at myself. Um, you know, it, it really. I, I think. I think that computers at some point will will get incredibly good. I, I don't know if it'll happen in my lifetime, and I'm older than most of the people, if not everyone in the room, but. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I, you're still dealing with zeros and ones, right? It's, everything's a yes or a no, and a combination of yeses and nos equals something. So I think the technology is a long ways away, and the irony is that, so one of our profs was speaking at a course, and he was talking about something really cutting edge, and the, pro, the other prof said, didn't we do this 10 years ago? <laughs> right? No, you saw that on TV. And then there's other stuff that's happening, like the adaptive prosthetics component, um, there's a, Professor down in Lethbridge, he's a Polaris chair, and his claim to fame was actually wiring into a mouse, um, hard wires, and every time it had a thought, you could actually, or a synapse fired, you could actually hear it on the computer. So I think that stuff will, I don't know if you remember, maybe Johnny Mnemonic. Um, but, you know, at some point in time, I think we will, we will become far more automated. If uh, Lockheed Martin created a exoskeleton, which we'd love to get our hands on, and I don't think we will, but it lifts a thousand pounds. So when they're loading planes on aircraft carriers, and our, our guys are pretty staunch pacifists too, so we don't do particularly much in the defense sector, but the, um, instead of having you know three people and a, a, a jack of some sort, this thing just picks it up and the guy can move around and bolt it on. So I think, I think it'll be kind of a, a relationship component. There's a lot of people doing work. Uh, there's, there's a group at the U of A that have actually created a and I'm not sure how far along they are, but they've actually created a uh, mechanical vertebrae. So if you've lost a vertebrae, they can actually, they're working on rebuilding that in something that would function. So it's not just a fused piece of bone, it becomes a functional piece of the body. So I, I think there's a pretty broad spectrum. So can I give a date, 2,153? Because we may not all be there. <laughs> yes. Um, data is really, really hard to get. Um, so healthcare data is next to impossible to get. And the reality is, anonymized data with enough triangulation, you can figure out who's in there. And machine learning is really good at de-anonymizing data. Um, so we've certainly worked with a bunch of healthcare data. We've, we've one of the projects we have is called Artisan, and it's with the, the schools in, in the Edmonton region. It's with Alberta Health Services, the emergency departments, and uh, HealthLink. And one of the biggest challenges is actually natural language processing. So taking, so you have structured data, semi-structured, and non-structured data. The non-structured data can be words or pictures or something like that. In this particular case, taking all of that, has anyone called um, HealthLink? So you're, you're sick, you call, you get to talk to a nurse, or you get to have some sort of conversation. They're writing notes. And there's, there's known, um, known uh, abbreviations like Rx is prescription. 
But there's other stuff that are plain old typos. If you have a number of 98, what is that? Is it blood pressure? Is it age? Is it a, a, you know, systolic, diastolic blood pressure? What is it? So we're able to actually take the contextual component of it, and it's for forecasting epidemiology. So when, when are you thinking you might have an outbreak and things like that? So that sort of data is pretty interesting. Um, capital markets data is really hard to come by. It When I was decades ago in, in the investment business, the exchange was actually free. The data was free at the exchange. As long as you plug into the exchange, it's free. It's the delivery component. But if you look at getting this data in real time and historically, it's, it's huge bucks. It's, it can be half a million bucks a month. Um, a lot of the data we'll, we'll create on our own. Uh, there's some stuff one of our guys has done in terms of a really inexpensive um, uh, tuberculosis test. So it's actually for the third world. Specifically, well, there's a patent being filed. The reason for it uh, is over in Thailand is because they want to make sure that it gets out to the masses. So it's something that's, I think it's saliva-based. So you can actually test a bunch of people incredibly cheaply and have a big impact in that regard. So I haven't really answered your question, but we have lots of different data we end up around with. But the, the healthcare data can be pretty cool. That's a it depends answer. Um, the nice thing about machine learning is it's very fungible in terms of ad adaptation. So again, the prosthetics, you could use it for capital markets. The nice, another th nice thing is data is data. So it really depends more on the schema and the structure of data. So if it's, if it's a known structure, um, you know, you may have something where you take, you have a known structure of a good example. So one of the projects we're working on is when you do drilling for oil and gas, you have to make sure you understand what the impact of the environment is. And part of this is, how does it impact game? So there are game trails where your deer and moose and everything walk by. Once you start doing things in that area, what is the impact of that? So they use uh, places like Cabela's will sell motion sensitive cameras that when an animal comes by, it'll take a picture. They literally had somebody sit down and look at 500,000 pictures to say, what is this and what's the timeline to figure? And then you gotta figure out, is this the same deer? Is it a cousin, is it, you know, all these things. So with machine learning, we can actually, because that data set exists already, that the training data, we, and we know what that is, we can actually go back and say, okay, we know what all these are, they've been annotated, here's our training data. Now we get a new data set of all these other pictures, and again, keeping in mind shadows, is it facing you, away from you, all these things. Um, the, you then can turn around, just once you've trained the program, you can actually say, go look at these pictures. So there's no easy answer to that. Uh, it can be incredibly complicated if your data is really messy, but if your data is clean, it's, it can be more of a matter of time. And it depends if you're re reusing algorithms or recreating new ones. So sorry, I don't have a very concrete answer on that, but it, it, it very much depends. I'm going to say two more questions. Okay. <laughs> right, we had one over here. Ah, let me give you an example. So this first part isn't going to be a machine learning example. It's an analytics example. This is one we discussed the other day. So I was working, I've done consumer products, a lot of different industries I've been in, and, and having started out in sales, I believe in impacting sales one-on-one. -on -one. An example of this is, if you sell in the healthcare space, especially to hospitals, it's very painful long sales cycles, but I can tell you of the 5,400 hospitals in the US, I can get a list that will tell you who the people are in the organization, what equipment they use, all sorts of great data like that. So I know who my prospects are and I know how to contact them. Consumer products, you really don't have any idea, right? Your product goes into a store and it may sell, it may not. Getting it pulled off the shelf is a hard, is a very hard part. This particular product, uh, we were very dependent on one retailer. And if somebody walked in, how many have ever walked into a real st retail store and somebody's given you really good information on a product in there? It doesn't happen very often because you've got 50,000 SKUs. So what would happen is when people came in and they would touch the product, we actually paid people to go in there and say, do you have any questions about this? And we talked to them. So of the people that touched that product, 90% of the people bought it, which is a pretty good number. So one of my analysts sits down, looks at the data, and says, you know, this cost is 100 grand a year to do this. And so I'm a big believer in intuition. 
I don't believe everyone's intuition is good, and nobody's intuition is good all of the time. Um, when he looked at it, he said, we're screwing ourselves. The people, we don't have anyone there, 95% of the people buy, so we're paying to lose sales. Um, so the machine learning component can actually just take an objective look at things. Um, another, and again, this doesn't directly apply, but, but I'll explain in a second. We have these little robotic dogs. They're two or three grand, and everyone was trying to program to see how fast it could run. We, one of our PIs is a, a guy named Rich Sutton who, had re, who invented something called reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is you treat a computer where you reward it for good behavior and penalize it for bad behavior. We won't take the discussion beyond that, but that's fundamentally how it works. So they took this little dog and stuck it in a space that's five by five or six by six and let it run around and try 100 things, drop the 95 that didn't work as well, keep the top five, and do that through millions of iterations. Then six to nine months, it could run faster than anyone else could program it. So that's a particular case of being able to have a computer learn things and do things better than humans can. As far as the intuition piece, I mean, there's certainly a large piece of deductive reasoning. Depends whether you believe in, in the uh, sixth, seventh, whatever dimension beyond the, the we currently have or is known to us. Um, I, I think there is a good space for that. Um, but again, going back to there's when you're working with incomplete data and unknowns, there's always going to be a swag factor. If I take a look at, at models you use in, the, in capital markets, one of them that's extremely well known um, it's called the Black-Scholes model. There's still some number in there. You've got to pick and go, that's the right number. If you look at a lot of the economic models, it's literally an XY axis with a line up, and they win Nobel Prizes for those. So as long as there's, a, there's an unknown factor that, I mean, you could statistically take a look at it or build some form of decision tree. And uh, we use poker a lot. And I will say that our guys don't play poker. But it's a great, and I don't care if they do, but it's a great Petri dish because you have incomplete information and you, have, you can do billions of iterations in a very short period of time. So that's a, that's a particular case where we can beat the best players in the world. It's not publicly available, probably never will be. But again, it's something where the computer does something better than the human intuition does. But it took a really long time to do that. that when I mentioned 2007, Jonathan Schaefer getting that uh, top 10 recognition, it was for solving checkers. And it's like a 40 or 50 year old problem. So checkers doesn't sound that complicated. We learned it, but it's billions and billions of iterations. And they can every single time play to a draw. So again, it, it's something that uh, I think over time it will get better. But it, it really depends on the data and the inputs and everything else. And you're, there's still somewhere along the way, if you have incomplete information, there's a swag factor. And humans may or may not be better at that. There was one more question we had right there. You know, I think we'll still see people living off the grid um, and who literally, I mean, truly live off the grid. But the, I think as time goes on, people, people adapt to it more. I look at um, my, my children and they're between the ages of 25 and 10 and uh, they're pretty comfortable with technology overall. I think I'm more comfortable with technology than my oldest, my oldest son is, but it's partly the nature of the work that I do. But one thing I'd actually, and Granify I think does some really cool stuff. Right? And I understand what, I've talked to Sean Abbott as well as, as, um, as uh, your founder. And <clears throat> if you, one of the challenges you have, and I think news is a good example, if you call somebody in another part of the world and ask them to type the same thing into a search engine, they will get a different news story than you will because they're trying to add the contextual component. So I think, I think there can be problems with that because it can be censorship at a certain point in time. So you, you end up going from this being really helpful to this all of a sudden telling me what I want to know and feeding me what it wants me to know. So I think, I think over time we'll get more comfortable. And I, I don't see a revolt where all of a sudden people are going to be throwing their computers away. We're a little too entertained by them. But I, I, I think that there is a risk that over time um, we don't know as much because of that. So 